That will bring us to roll call. Here. 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 Yay, we are all here. Uh, at this point, I would like to jump in a little bit ahead of schedule and recommend that there be a certain reordering of the agenda. We have presentations that we would like to move to the end of the agenda so we can get through the public hearings first. And anybody who's not interested in listening to the general plan update can go home and start preparing for the holidays. Um, also, we would like to recommend that item 9C be continued to a date uncertain. The applicants uh, still need more time to work with the state on some remediation documents for their line. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Bruce. Um, I will then make a motion that we move our presentation to the end of our meeting before item 10 and that we can, I guess we'll vote on that motion first, right? <coughs> um, so I'd like to make a motion that we move item 4 to after item 9. A second. I have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And I will also make a motion that we continue item 9C to a date uncertain. Second. I have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much. Any other information on the nope. agenda? I'll, on the item 6. All right. Thank you very much. Item 6, may I please get a motion to waive the full reading of the resolutions on the agenda for this meeting? Motion to waive the full reading of resolutions on the agenda for the meeting. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. That brings us to item 7 on our agenda, which is public comments. And this is your time to come up um, for public comments on our consent calendar items and on any items that are not on our agenda. If you are interested in speaking, please come forward and fill out a speaker slip so we get your name proper in our notes, and you'll have three minutes to speak. This is for any items that are not on our agenda or on our consent calendar. Our consent calendar this evening simply consists of the approving of our minutes from last month. Okay, seeing no one, that moves us to our consent calendar. May I get a motion to approve? <coughs> so moved. I have a motion. Second. I have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the consent calendar is approved. That brings us to item 9A. This item will be presented by Perry Banner. The item that we'll be presenting to you is Site Plan Review 19-004 and Density Bonus Agreement 19-001. The applicant, Meta Housing, doing our operating as Juniper Grove Apartments for this project, is requesting to develop an affordable housing project on a 4.75 acre vacant site located at the southeast corner of Avenue R and Division Street. The project will consist of three joined three-story multifamily residential buildings with a total of 101 dwelling units, 30% of which will be affordable to low-income individuals. To give you a, a sense of the project vicinity, you can see where the project site is highlighted in yellow. Um, off to the uh, sort of kitty corner from it, uh, to the northwest is the Palmdale Learning Plaza. Just to the east is Ridgeview Village Apartments. You can see that there's a lot of vacant land around the site and single family uh, developments just to the south. So to start to orient you a little bit uh, with regard to the project, this is kind of a combination site plan, landscaping plan. Uh, north would be to the right in uh, the way that this is laid out. So Avenue R is um, to the right of the, the um, the, the image in Division Street is, is running along the top. Um, so there would be access to the site from both Division and Avenue R. Um, maybe a little hard to make out here, but there's three buildings. Uh, I know the pointer doesn't work, or here, maybe we can do this. There we go. So there's kind of three structures, a building here, a building here, and a building here, uh, connected on the second and third floors by these walkway bridges. 
um, large amount of uh, common open space and amenities that are associated with the project, including community room, fitness room, library, uh, offices for service providers, uh, etc. I think that was just a little zoomed in, um, same image, just a little bit zoomed in. We'll get back to probably be toggling back and forth to this image as we have this discussion. Before we kind of launch into how this project um, meets the development standards of the municipal code, I think that we need to kind of lay out one of the elements of this project, which is the density bonus. And this is not something that I think the Planning Commission has seen in a while. I understand that the last density bonus project may have been uh, three or four years ago. So for the kind of uninitiated, I want to give you an explanation as to what density bonus law is and how it applies to this project. So first of all, we're, we're referring to state density bonus law, which is kind of trickled down into the municipal code. And what, um, what this entails is an applicant that's um, applying for a density bonus is allowed an increase in the number of dwelling units um, that may be built on the site in exchange for including affordable project or affordable units in the project. And this kind of operates on a bit of a sliding scale. The, the greater the number of affordable units you provide, the, the greater the amount of density, extra density that you're allowed to build on the site. And that sliding scale also works with levels of income. So you're, you can get greater density but by providing more very low income units versus providing more moderately uh, low income units. In this case, the project site is a base density per the general plan of 10.1 to 16 dwelling units per acre. Um, the, pro the, the applicant is proposing to provide 30% low income units. In this case, according to the sliding scale, the city would, would then be allowed to grant, or would, in fact they're required to grant, a 35% density bonus over the base density, which is an additional 5.6 dwelling units per acre. So the proposed density then of 21.6 dwelling units per acre is allowed by state density bonus law. So how that plays out in the project uh, as far as a breakdown in the number of units, as I mentioned, the, the total number of units on the project is 101. Uh, the 41 or 49 rather units are one bedrooms, 27 two bedrooms, and 25 three bedrooms dispersed throughout the, um, the complex. Just quickly moving into the development standards, um, with regard to building setbacks, height, lot coverage, the project does in fact um, meet the requirements of the Palmdale Municipal Code. With regard to parking, here's the, um, how state density bonus affects the required amount of parking. And this you can find in the Municipal Code as well, um, which like I say, trickle down from state density bonus law. But with um, when you're applying for a density bonus and you're building an affordable uh, project like this, the required parking is, is a little less than what the, the code might otherwise allow for a, um, uh, for a straightforward development. So in this case, one bedroom units are only require uh, one parking space, two to three bedroom units require um, two on-site parking spaces. So the site will provide a total of 153 on-site parking spaces that are provided by way of either a covered carport or open air spaces. And this 153 um, parking spaces is in compliance with the requirements of the density bonus law. Now moving on to a couple of other development standards and here this is where I'm going to get into density bonus law again. I just probably will toggle back and forth to this one too. But density bonus law allows something else. It allows an applicant that's proposing to build an affordable housing project to request concessions or incentives from the municipal code. And the logic behind this is that the the allowance of concessions 
will help to close the financial gap that uh, occurs when you're doing an affordable housing project. If you're providing affordable housing, you're not going to be able to capture the, the, the fair market rate um, that you otherwise would for a, a market rate unit. And so what the density bonus law allows an applicant to request from the city is concessions on development standards. And, and it can be any number of concessions that are allowed. It's not really spelled out in state density bonus law, but the applicant would make those, uh, that request, the city would analyze it, and, uh, and then it would determine if, if in fact, there is a, a cost savings by allowing these concessions, a cost savings that then closes that financial gap and allows the project to pencil out. So for this project, the applicant is allowed or requesting three concessions. They're requesting a reduction in open area to 30,800 square feet, which is 16.7% of the site. Otherwise, the, the code would allow or would require 30% open area, which would have been 55,550 square feet. So that's concession number one. Concession number two is with regard to the distance, the minimum distance requirements, or rather the maximum distance requirement from a parking space to the, the front or rear door of a dwelling unit. And what the code says is that that distance can't be any more than 150 feet. So for, for this particular project, there are units that are a maximum of 360 feet away from a parking stall. Um, so the applicant is requesting that um, that, that be concession be granted. And finally, the third concession is that the um, required private open space by way of patios and balconies, which, is, which should be 150 feet, the applicant is requesting that that be reduced to 90 square feet. I'll move forward. And so I, just in closing, though, what I'd like to say here is that Part of what we do when we're analyzing these concessions is that the, the developer will put together a development performa, which, which is the kind of the financial breakdown of the cost of construction, the cost of engineering and architecture. They submitted that to the city, highlighting where um, there's going to be cost savings with regard to these concessions. That performa was analyzed by the housing division of the city, and the housing division did determine that yes, there are indeed um, cost savings by granting these concessions, allowing the project then to pencil out. So moving on to um, just continuing on with the analysis of the project uh, with regard to access, circulation, and parking. As I mentioned, there'll be access off of both uh, Division Street and Avenue R. Um, there will be uh, dedications uh, granted for um, the construction of a right turn lane along northbound Division Street at the intersection of Division and Avenue R, and also for a right turn pocket into the site along eastbound Avenue R. Uh, I mentioned that um, there will be uh, 153 parking spaces in total on the site, 115 of which will be covered. Here's something else um, that you should be aware that the, that the state density bonus law allows. It's tandem parking configurations. And so um, there are tandem parking proposed, not for all of the parking on the site, but for some areas. And this is, a, um, this is one of the, the items that state density bonus law does allow. Just to give you a, a sense of the, the building architecture, you'll, you'll probably know from the plans that there were quite a number of elevations that were uh, presented. I just wanted to give you a, a flavoring. Um, this is kind of a, a style that really is sort of typical of Southern California, but there are, you'll see, you'll see from the elevations that um, they do in, include variations in color and finishes just to provide that kind of visual interest to, to break up the, um, the, the plane of those, uh, of those uh, buildings. Uh, the building materials are durable. Uh, they consist of sand finished stucco, lap siding, fiber cement fascia, uh, wood trim, concrete roof tile, tile. so the, the building will be durable and the color palette is compatible with the desert environment. 
with regard to the environmental review, there was an initial study and mitigation prepared, mitigated negative declaration prepared for the project. Um, what was uh, determined was that um, the potential for environmental impacts uh, either found that there would be no impact, a less than significant impact, um, or a less than significant impact with mitigation measures incorporated. So I want to talk about the, the documents that were on the dais for you today. Um, we don't generally like to provide last minute items for the Planning Commission. Um, but there were things that came in after the agenda packet had been distributed, one of which came in very late, uh, came in today. Um, and there was actually two supplementals. So uh, I just want to address those very quickly. Um, the first supplemental report, it looks like a meaty document, but there's just, there's a lot of essentially supporting documents for three conclusions. Uh, one was that um, there was a letter of support for the project that was a written letter that was uh, provided. We wanted to present that to the Planning Commission that would become part of the record for this project. Also, there were responses to comment letters. There were two comment letters that came from the, um, the circulation of the mitigated ne negative declaration that came from Caltrans and from the Department of Fish and Game. Um, now, the responses to those comments uh, essentially uh, had determined that there's, there's no substantive changes that um, uh, the comments don't affect the environmental document or the project at all, and that um, there was no need to uh, either prepare an EIR or to recirculate the initial study and mitigated negative declaration. And finally, with that first memo, the once the staff report was um, delivered to the applicant, the applicant had a chance to review and uh, go over the conditions of approval. The applicant requested some changes, some modifications to the conditions of approval. Um, again, not, um, not anything that was major. Uh, just very quickly, request one and two related to rewording of a couple of the mitigation measures pertaining to biological resources. The third request uh, related to a driveway design issue that had previously been resolved with the traffic and uh, traffic engineering. And finally, request number four uh, was some boilerplate language that, that made its way into the conditions of approval that really didn't apply to the project, so we, um, we struck that. And so staff concurs with the applicant um, and the requested changes and recommends that the project be modified accordingly. And just very quickly with the second memorandum, um, there was one of the things that we do in this process is uh, something called tribal consultation. We reach out to the, the tribes that have, um, that have maybe have a history of being in the area and we, we look for their input, input on projects. And so there's a, con cons a consultation prog um, process that had begun. Uh, one of the tribes had requested a kind of a more sophisticated cultural resources assessment. Um, that kind of ended up overlapping a little bit with the initial study and mitigated negative declarations. We got comments, uh, unfortunately, a little bit late from the tribe. But the one thing that I want to point out is that the, the recommended mitigation measures that the, the tribe is requesting in that email, they are the same in spirit as to mitigation measures that are already incorporated in the initial study. So the, the tribe isn't asking for anything additional in the way of mitigation. They're just asking for those um, mitigation measures to be worded slightly differently. So it would be our recommendation that the language from the tribe be incorporated into the initial study and mitigated neg negative declaration and um, and that'll take care of the uh, the request from from that uh, from that tribe so to conclude the the project will help to infill that area that's kind of east of state route 14 and avenue r there's if you remember from that vicinity map there's some um, a number of vacant parcels in that area, let's start to fill that out. Um, providing services to the project will be more cost effective than extending services out to the outer edges of the city. 
So it's a good example of infill development in the city. Uh, the site has ready access to commercial amenities that are within half a mile of the site, employment opportunities, schools, and to um, State Route 14. And finally, the, uh, the project will provide housing options for low-income families in a well-designed development that includes multiple on-site amenities. So the Planning Commission tonight, you have three options, really. One is to adopt resolution number PC 2019-050 as amended, approving um, site plan review 19-004, recommending that the city council approve density bonus agreement 19-001, and adopting the mitigated negative declaration, the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, finding that the project will not result in a significant impact on the environment. That's option one. Option two would be to continue the item and direct staff to return with additional information or option three would be to deny the project. Uh, staff is recommending option one. And I'll end the presentation there and take any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Banner. Do any of the commissioners have technical questions for staff on their report at this time? I do, just a brief question. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it, it provided a lot of clarity with respect to the density uh, state law, so I appreciate that. Um, I had to do a lot of, li lot of research on that myself because I was not familiar with it, so your presentation was really in alignment with that. Thank you. Thank you. With respect to the tri uh, tribal community, did you, was there an invitation reached out to them to come tonight to uh, talk about their concerns? So th this is how tribal consultation works. I'll give it to you in kind of a, a nutshell. Um, once we deem a project complete, uh, a project that requires um, a certain level of, of uh, environmental review, we, we begin this tribal consultation process. So there's some standard letters that we'll send, we'll send out to the tribes that had previously indicated that they want to be informed of these projects. So we, we usually get responses from a handful of, of the tribes, uh, two in particular really, and the, um, the, the email came from one of them. So what happened as far as the chain of events is concerned is that um, uh, we had, they had indicated that yes, they want to undergo consultation for this project. So we provided them with additional information. Um, then after they had read that information, that's when they, initially the project did a cultural resources report, which was, um, which is sort of a, a look at uh, what might be on record in terms of cultural resources in, in the project vicinity or on the, on the project site. Uh, what the tribe had requested was go a little further. We want to see a cultural resources assessment, which would be actually physically going out to the site and, and surveying the site. Mm -hmm. So that, that takes a little time and a little money to, to undergo. So that was, that was performed. We sent that document back to um, the tribe that had requested it in uh, late October. And, um, and so long story short is that I didn't get that email, as I said, until about 4.16 to be exact. And when I, right. by the time I made contact with the, the representative, their, their office had closed. Okay. So they, they know that they're always welcome to come to these meetings, and we encourage that. Okay. Um, but we didn't get that opportunity tonight. But they, but, so apparently they did come out and look at the land and had an opportunity. Well, the, so a, um, a consultant would have gone out uh, I'm not sure if it's an archaeologist or who goes right. out to do that, but there, there was, that report was prepared, and that report was then sent to the tribe, and the tribe reviewed mm -hmm. that. Okay. And then based on that cultural resources assessment, then they generated these requested mitigation measures. Right, and that was in October, right? Yes. Okay. And the last question I had was, is the, what's the expected date of completion of this project, if you know? I, I, would, I know that the applicant is eager to, to get the project underway. There is, they'll, they'll still have to go through um, building safety and engineering. Uh, the applicant is here tonight, so they'd probably be better equipped to answer that question. But there is a, um, it's got momentum. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other technical questions? Um, Mr. Banner, if, could you please give me a, I, I know that this says that we're looking to uh, provide this affordable housing for low and very low income families. Can you give me a 
guideline as to what how, how that is determined what is considered low income and very low income sure so um, every year there is a determination of the kind of the area medium income for the state of California um, Rob correct me if I'm wrong it comes I think it comes it comes down from from HUD or HCD, yeah. And so for LA County, for example, um, you know we get these numbers every year. So for 2019, um, the area median income in, in LA County is, and I'm going to go typically the kind of the number that they like to use is for a family of four. Okay. okay? So the area median income for a family of four in LA County is seventy three thousand one hundred dollars. Um, which is kind of interesting because the, the low income is actually $83,500. And then if you go a step further, the, uh, the very low income uh, threshold is $52,200. So the, the families that the, the project is targeting, um, the low income families are, and we're, we're talking about a family that's earning Eighty-three thousand five hundred, and I mean, I think as the planning commission knows, I mean, with the cost of housing, that's a potentially a, a teacher. I mean. All right. Thank you very much. Welcome. Right. At this time, I would like to open the public hearing on this item. If anybody is here to speak, please come forward. State your name, and I do request that you fill out a speaker slip simply so we get your name typed correctly in our minutes. So if there's anybody here to speak, and you will have three minutes, there is a timer on our screen, so please pay attention to that. And I do have one slip. Is there anybody else? All right, then I will let you go first. We have a slip here from Tim Soul. Vice President with Meta Housing Corporation. I'm just here to express uh, our uh, excitement about continuing our relationship with the city of Palmdale. Uh, we have developed uh, the Corson Arts Project uh, near the Civic Center and are about to finish the Corson Pool. And we're very excited about the prospect of continuing our work in the city. And Tonight, I'm joined by my uh, colleague, Scott Akatari, who is uh, the technical expert on the project. We're also joined by our uh, property management team, our supportive services team, our architect, um, as well as our environmental professional. We welcome your questions. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Sewell. Do any of the um, commissioners have questions for the applicant? OK. Yes. My concern is the number of parking spaces. The the one the one bedroom units get one parking space, and I'm just wondering. I mean, then you have to have one person living there. You have two people and you have two cars. Where's the extra car going? I mean, is there is, are there parking spaces for overflow, or is there offsite parking? Is there a place for a second car if somebody lives there and there's a second car? Or what do they do? Hi, uh, I'm Scott Nakatari, Meta Housing. Um, so all of the, the parking spaces are assigned, um, but and we have a property manager here as well, but they can be rearranged in the sense that if there is not a need for one, one person's or families, then there is some flexibility there. So I believe that the parking, you know, it, it's per the density bonus um, regulations. So, um, and then uh, where do guests park? Because they can't really park on Avenue R. You can't park on Division. If there's guests, I mean, where will you park? Right. Parking is something that's very contentious among people. That's what starts fights. And if there's yeah. not parking, I mean, yes. that could be chaos. Right. We do have s parking spaces outside of the gate as well. And so, um, there, there isn't any required for, for the density bonus, but they're, they're based on what we've seen at other projects and also on the course in the east, that parking hasn't been an issue um, with, with this uh, number per the density bonus. So you already have a pro project course in the east. Did you use the same uh, one parking spot 
for one bedrooms the same standard for that? And right. mm -hmm. what has now been the uh, experience of that? Are there people who live in units that don't have cars? Yes, that is the case, and it is the same uh, density bonus um, um, regulations that we use. But I mean, we could bring up our property other, manager. I mean, the way I, I, I'm thinking of that is because um, this is not next to public transportation. So if it were close to public transportation, it would be reasonable to believe they don't need a car. But I mean, how do people get around if, you know, again, if there's more than two people living in a unit and you've got two cars, I think there could be problems with fights over parking spaces. Right. And actually, I'll present Gianna because we have some real kind of case history with the Course in Arts project. So. Thank you. My name's Gianna Richards, and the first name spelled G-I-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, last name Richards. In response to the question on parking, we have found that at our course and communities that it's about 81.5% of uh, parking spaces used. And we do a parking survey where we look in the morning, in the middle of the day, in the evening, and then later in the evening, just to be sure. And we also um, assign vehicles a parking permit and a specific parking space. And the reason we have less vehicles is because we have found that the one bedroom uh, households do have two persons in their households. However, they have one vehicle, primarily shared, some, shared amongst them. And then the larger households, the same thing, they're not using two vehicles, which has allowed for the additional spaces. But as far as the um, altercations that could occur, that's why we assign parking spaces with parking permits. So everybody knows where their parking space is and it's not, oh, I wanted this space and now my neighbor's in it, so I'm upset. It's very much monitored in that regard. So the course in connection though, this is specifically designated for seniors. Isn't that correct? No, no sir. That's not a senior project? Art, it's artists and veterans. Oh, artists. The neighboring project was uh, Whispering, Whispering Palms, is, right. which, is a, okay. which is... So the one you're talking about is artists. And veterans. And veterans. And veterans, yes. okay. And you're finding that there are some that don't have cars? Yes, sir. Wow. I think in the low income, I, when you're talking low and low, low income, I, I think that that is probably a mitigating thing there. But. And then is it, is, isn't there more of an opportunity for public transportation, though, in the course and connection than there would be on Avenue R and Division? I would have to refer to Scott on that question. I would imagine yes. So it's a little more public transportation friendly, friendly. of course, and connection. But we're still, I'm sorry to interrupt, we're still at 81.5% parked, which is not, it leaves a significant amount of parking left. And then what about the visitor parking? Where would the visitors park? For the new community? I, for the, the um, what do you call this? Uh, for Juniper? Yeah, the, the I would are. put that to Scott, but what we would do is outside where Scott mentioned earlier outside, there's parking outside of the gate, and then we can assign uh, guest parking based on the spaces that go unused. And we, we're able to unassign that or assign it because we have the control, not to sound dictator like a dictator, but we have the control over the parking assignments. It's not just a free-for-all parking. And then the tandem spots you would give those to the same unit, right? You wouldn't yes, put sir. two different units in the no, same spot. No, no, sir. So then there'd be fighting over There would be fighting stuff. then, yes. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, that's my main concern. I mean, obviously, this is a, you know, we really need all of the, this low-income housing. We need to satisfy the state requirements <coughs> for the housing units. Um, it looks like a beautiful project. I just hate to see people fighting over parking spaces. As would we. And that seems like apartments, that's the thing they fight about is parking spaces. That end, you know, we're it's close to the freeway, so without the security of the gates and everything, there would be a lot of issues with, um, uh, you know, crime because people like to do a crime and jump on the freeway and run away. But so there, there, there's these gates are going to be closed all the time. And Correct. Secured and so there'll be controlled access through um, the residents that have um, remotes okay. or fob. Is there security uh, at this complex too? At the Juniper, the proposed yes. community? The proposed community, yeah. Would there be security as well? Because the gate is closed. There would be surveillance and monitoring um, so that, following on the other residents and all the residents who are living in the unit. Okay. And that would be the security. There's even off-site property manager and everything like that. Oh, that lives on? 
Correct. We will have on-site staff living on-site and FOBs controlling where people have access to, that we can see who was there based on the time their key FOB swiped. And what's the expected date? That would be a, a question. If you could please come to the microphone when you speak. Thank you. Yeah. While, while he's coming up, I'd just like to point out that condition 112.2 requires a security plan to be reviewed by the city and approved. Thank, Thank you. you. So, so as far as the timing yeah. of it, um, we are we would have to go through construction dock approval with the city, and so roughly around probably July or August would start with around a fifteen month uh, construction period. So we're talking the end of towards the end of twenty twenty two. Twenty twenty two. Yeah. Okay. And and I don't know if you can answer this question or the city. What what's the process if somebody who's viewing this right now and they want to apply? Do you is there early um, the ability to apply early and submit an application now? Or? Well, what we would do is put their name on an interest list. We gather all the, pe the names of people who are interested and we stay in communication with them, letting them know the update of here's where we are in construction. We're at 10%, 50%, 80%, and we will just maintain all of those names and we communicate by email. And if people don't have email, then we send a, a postal letter. So how do, they get, how, do they, how do they know who to contact? Once the community is um, under construction, we will have the appropriate signage up with our contact information oh, with, a, a, with an 800 number and an email address. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else here to speak on this item? May I get a motion to close the public hearing, please? Second. Second. I have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The public hearing on this item is now closed. We've already had a bit of commissioner discussion, but if we could do it at this point, that would be helpful as well. Um, I do no, I know I know that Mr. Bruce did comment. We each did receive an email, I believe, from the Yes at My Backyard group. Um, and then we did have it on the dais today as well. So and they were in support of the project. And also, I think, is the, can you explain a little bit, Rob, the parking is, per the density bonus agreement, that, that's something. That is a offer. standard that the state supersedes okay. the city on. Yes, that's what I thought. Okay. So we don't have any discretion Correct. on the number of spaces or the fact that they're tandem. Correct. When you go into the density bonus agreement with Correct. the low and low, low income. That, that's one of the things that the state gives as an incentive okay. to affordable de developers. Now, um, <clears throat> do we have many other complexes? In the city that have used that standard, and do we know how how they how the standard performs? Um, I believe all of our affordable projects have used the standard. Whether or not they've used tandem spaces, I, I I'm well, not familiar with. The tandem, I'm, I mean, if they have the same unit as getting the tandem spots, it, I'm not I'm so concerned about that. I'm just wondering, like, how old is that guideline that says one that like you can do one space per uh, one bedroom? And probably ten or fifteen years at least. And you know, how many projects have been built that way, and are we running into any disputes? I'm not aware of any. Um, Vicki, who is in our uh, housing division, um, is, is involved in the monitoring of these projects, and are you aware of any parking disputes? No, we are not. We haven't seen any issues. Okay. Thank you, Vicki. I, I <laughs> the school there, I know at school, let out time, that's the traffic on there has been a big issue. Is parking allowed on Division or on R right there? Do we have a traffic engineer? A traffic engineer is here and available How to answer that question. How lucky that you're here! <laughs> We're so well prepared here. Uh, good evening. Um, <laughs> my name? Ruben. Ruben Hovind asked him with the City of Palmdale <laughs> Transportation. Um, some of the questions you guys have been asking about um, transit and parking and stuff. Um, on Avenue R and Division, those are major streets. We typically discourage parking on those. Whether that area is already signed to not allow parking right now, I can't tell you. But if we do have issues with that, we would go out and prevent parking there. We have that authority. Um, in terms of transit in that vicinity, um, there's uh, transit and ABTA right about a mile to the east and then half a mile to the north of there. So about 10-minute walking distance. Okay. It's a long walk of a mile. 
they gotta walk a mile to get a bus? Um, when we do transit analysis and kind of ridership, we typically use anywhere from a quarter to half a mile um, buffers around bus stops in terms of what it would capture in terms of people who ride transit when distances they're willing to walk. Um, the development and who the audience is that this is aimed at, it makes sense and it all flows in terms of what we've seen typically done. Now, um, the city probably doesn't dictate where the bus stops. That would be ABTA, wouldn't it? Correct. We work with ABTA. Any development that comes in, this one included, we send through ABTA so that they have a chance to look at it and see whether they need to have any accommodations uh, for the developer to put on site for them, such as bus pullouts or any other improvements that they need to provide. And they also take that into consideration as they develop their bus plans and modify schedules and routes. So it would seem like you've got an apartment complex next door. Now you have 101 units. It would make a lot of sense to have a bus stop right in front. No, and then that would be something that would be nice to consider when you're doing the site design. Have a little bus stop, you know, kind of in the front, so that ABTA says, "Hey, great, you made a bus stop for us." So ABTA is currently undergoing a regional transit plan. Um, part of that is looking at both current development and future development coming in. So they're looking at things that we know are in the pipeline, and what's already been developed since the last time they've done the study, so that they could modify their routes accordingly. Additionally, they participate in the development review process. So if they recommend, if they get, they get the plans, and then they can choose to recommend a bus turnout or not. Again, it would be a great spot. You have a veterans housing uh, neighborhood across the street coming in. you got a school right there. You have all these apartments. That corner is ideal for a bus stop. I'm going to imagine that will be happening in the near future yeah. because they're seeing that as well as all the schools in the area. So, um, I, I do, if I understand correctly from the map, it's right turn in and right turn out of Division Street and Avenue R from the... Um, Avenue R. Oh, that's I believe that you cannot make a left turn into this from Avenue R. Then. Correct. Okay. We're putting a concrete median along okay. Avenue R to prevent that movement, both okay. no lefts in or left turns out. Okay. However, from Division Street, you will be able to make a left turn. You will be able to own Division. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ruben. Right. You're welcome. Any other commissioner discussion, comments, thoughts, feelings? I. I'm really excited about the project. Uh, I think it's something that's really needed in our community, so I commend uh, those who are making the commitment to make it happen. I'm not only happy that you are concerned about the low income, but the very low income, which it's is really not that interesting. Low. Three thousand dollars, <laughs> not that well, low. <laughs> at least it's being considered. So I think that's something that um, is is very very um, important for us to have in our community. So. I support the idea. And I think it's also, what I like also is that it's being built with uh, facilities inside to allow outside people to come in and assist, um, whether it be counseling or art programs or whatever. There's offices and, and meeting space and all of that, which I think is very helpful to, to whoever will be living there. So. Excuse me with a comment, I can make a motion. Okay. When you make your motion, I am just going to gently remind you that it will be as amended and it will be using the touch screen. So go for it. <laughs> oh, now you're all quiet. Now nobody wants to do it. Okay, good luck with it. Put that screen back up where we can read it. So it'll be page four. Or page, yeah. Yep. Can we just do it this way? Yep. So I'd like to make a motion to adopt resolution number PC2019-050, approving site plan review 19-004, recommending that the City Council approve density bonus agreement 19-001, and adopting the mitigated negative uh, declaration and mitigation monitoring and reporting program, finding that the project will not result in a significant impact on the environment. And are you making that motion as amended? I am making the motion okay. as amended. Will you push your button, please? I sure will. Then I'll second it. Yay. All right. <laughs> I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? All right. Then we will call for the question on our touch screen.
which is touchy, just so you know. They don't always listen to us. I'm doing it. I know. Did it? I did. I did it three times as a matter of fact. So it's not just. It's me. not us, okay? It is all technology. We do know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I pushed it, you pushed it. <laughs> there we go. Let the record show that the motion passes with five yes votes. Thank you very much, and congratulations. Thank you. That will bring us to item 9B. This item will be presented by Carleen Saxton. Good evening. So I am presenting on the application for a 10-year time extension to a previously approved motocross track location. Um, it's located south of Avenue T East, or East Avenue T, sorry. Um, and as you can see on the screen, it is an existing motocross track and consists of approximately 60 acres within um, the granite construction quarry pit. The site was used from 1964 to 2007 as both a track, drag car race track as well as a motocross site. In 2007, granite construction began extracting um, extraction of mining materials. And so the drag race portion dropped off. However, the motocross continued into, th into 2010. Here is the site plan. Um, the site, like I said, facilitates the motocross practice and non-major events during the weekday and major events on the weekend. Um, because I needed to educate myself, um, I'll tell you what motocross is. <laughs> it's, <laughs> motocross is a form of off-road motorcycle racing, and um, it's held on enclosed off-road circuits. So um, it has two tracks that are going to be used, and they're proposing to operate Wednesday through Sunday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. There are going to be portable toilets available on site, trash pickup, ADA compliance, and um, there's going to be safety rules and regulations posted at the main entrance because obviously this is um, a little bit of a risky activity. Um, and there's going to be dust control as well. Options for our planning commission are to approve the resolution uh, or adopt the resolution approving the CUP time extension number one and find that the project will not result in any changes to the previously approved mitigated negative declaration. Another option is to continue the item and direct staff to return with additional information or to deny the project. Option one is recommended. I am available for any questions, and the applicant and owner are also here. Thank you very much, Ms. Saxton. Sure. Do <clears throat> commissioners have any technical questions for staff on their report at this time? I'm sorry, you, you said the hours of operation and when meetings were. Hours of operation are Wednesday through Sunday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., so essentially daylight. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, I would like to open the public hearing on this item. If anybody is here to speak, please come forward, state your name, and fill out a speaker slip, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Seeing no public to be heard, may I get a motion to close the public hearing? Motion close to close the public hearing. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The public hearing on this item is now closed. Any commissioner discussion on the item? You really couldn't have a better location for that. I mean, it's almost underground. I mean, there's no, you can't hear anything. You can't see anything. Um, it's, a, it's a great amenity to have in the community. It'd be nice to have more of them. But it's a, it's a great thing to have. I mean, is there any way to put a drag strip in there again? But there's no room for a drag strip. Oh, Do not I see it's all carved out really cool in there. The picture that was on this must have been a very old picture that you had on the screen there because there was no motocross track in the picture. It was all flat, but it's all a motocross track, and they've got all the booths and everything there now. But it's a, it's a really nice, uh, a nice thing to have in our community. All right, any other no downside to it? Any other comments? All right, then may we get a motion using our touch screen? A motion to adopt resolution PC 2019052 approving conditional use permit 14007 
plan extension number one and find the, that the project will not result in any changes to the previously adopted mitigated negative declaration. Second. We'll let the record show we have a motion from Commissioner French and a second from Commissioner Henderson. Any discussion on the motion? All right, then we shall call for the question. And let the record reflect that the motion passes with five yes votes. Thank you very much. And that will bring us backwards to item 4A, also to be presented, I believe, by Ms. Saxton. comes with music. That's good. A couple, like couple technical <laughs> difficulties. <laughs> Not a sound you really want to hear from your junior. It's supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So the next item is an update on our general plan. Um, we're going to do a little presentation and then some discussion from the planning commissioners. And the presentation is going to be given by our consultant, um, Simran, from Ramey and Associates. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Simran Malhotra, and I'm a principal with Remy and Associates. Uh, we are the lead consultants hired for the general plan update. Um, the council approved our contract uh, about a year ago, and we've been diligently working uh, with our team of consultants, uh, our subconsultants who represent transportation uh, and environmental. Um, analysis, uh, mobility, um, traffic, uh, and um, and other um, aspects of um, for the for the project. Um, so what what we have for you today is an update on the overall process, the an overview of the existing conditions analysis that our team has conducted so far. Uh, highlights from the community engagement process uh, that we have completed to date, and to present ideas for vision and guiding principles um, that we have heard from the community as well as uh, from the general plan advisory committee that the uh, council had instituted at the start of the project. So to begin with, um, briefly, what is a general plan? Um, it's a document that's a roadmap um, for the future of the city and it establishes the city's long-term vision for the next 25 years. It indicates how a community will change and grow and what the community's values and priorities are. And as you know, every city is, re in, is required to have a general plan in the state of California and it uh, contains goals, policies and implementing uh, actions that provide direction to city staff and to uh, city commissions and councils in their decision making as they evaluate projects. So what does the Palmdale uh, general plan look like today? It has nine elements and except for housing which was updated in 2014, the rest were last updated comprehensively in 1993 and 1994. So it's been 25 years um, since the, the city took a comprehensive look at their general plan. And a lot has changed since then. And last year, the council established a goal to take a fresh and full look at the entire document. Uh, we started our process with a review of the 1993 general plan, which contained eight overall goals and priorities. And these are listed on the screen here. Um, and I won't read through all of these in the interest of time, and, but these are mostly valid today. But as we know, the world has changed in the intervening 25 years. Um, the city has grown both in land area and population. Uh, we have the potential of high-speed rail 
um, from the California High Speed Rail and Virgin Trains USA anticipated to have rail service in Palmdale. Uh, there are new state requirements for general plans, uh, complete streets, uh, health, equity, safety, uh, etc. There are additional requirements that uh, general plans need to reflect. Uh, and then there are technological innovations on the horizon and in place. Uh, we have Uber and Lyft and uh, we'll potentially be seeing driverless cars in the near future. And as described later in the presentation, residents today may have different or additional values and concerns that were in place back in the early 90s. So the process briefly, um, it's a six step process and it's, uh, it will take about two to three years. Um, as I said, we are in step two right now. So we started with exploring issues and identity opportunity, excuse me, and during our existing conditions analysis and um, and we have followed that with uh, the development of a vision and guiding principles. Following this process, which is where, on this step, which is where we are today, we'll be creating alternatives for land use, what goes where, uh, and the ways we travel to get there. Uh, we'll get input from the community at that point, as well as from the Planning Commission and, and the City Council, and then um, develop the preferred plan. Um, the preferred plan then um, will be, we'll develop policy solutions to address the, the desired plan uh, and do the technical studies needed to make sure that it'll work so people can get to where they need to, traffic will flow smoothly, etc. We'll then prepare the general plan uh, document it's, uh, and then that'll come back to you for uh, review and adoption um, by, um, by the City Council. And throughout the process, we have multiple opportunities for the community to provide their input and uh, get additional information. And I'll describe that uh, in a little bit more detail later in the presentation. Uh, the next 10 odd slides um, have a high level snapshot of what Palmdale is like today. You know, it tells us who lives in the city, what kinds of jobs are available, how people move around, who we should be planning for, and what the distribution of land uses are. Um, the city is the first city in, um, um, in the Antelope Valley to incorporate in 1962, so 58-odd years ago. And it has grown in area uh, to being the seventh largest city in the state of California uh, in terms of uh, area. Um, 103 square miles fall within the city limits, which is shown as in gray on the map. And then it has seven, six, 67 additional square miles in, this, in the sphere of influence. So that's a very large uh, land area that the city uh, contains within its boundaries and for, and for planning purposes. In terms of demographics, um, the city has grown uh, exponentially in the last six, uh, 40 years. In 1980, the population was 12,000, and it's almost 160,000 uh, in 2018. And the city has a very young population. Uh, almost a third of the residents are under 18. And the city has few residents in the age groups 25 to 44 compared to the rest of Antelope Valley and LA County, um, which does ha have an impact on uh, who the workers in the city are, who's, who's actually gainfully employed. Uh, in terms of uh, racial and ethnic distributions and education levels, um, the city is very diverse racially. More than 50% are Hispanic or Latino, about a quarter of the population is white, and about 10% are African American, and a, a small portion is Asian. The graph on the left compares the city with uh, the rest of the Antelope Valley and uh, the, uh, the county as, as a whole. The graph on the right compares uh, educational levels for uh, Palmdale, the rest of Antelope Valley and the county. And as you can see, the number of residents with less than high, sc high school education is high compared to the other two uh, entities. And this is important because it helps us understand the mismatch between um, the population and the available jobs in the city. 
Uh, the median household income uh, is a little bit lower than uh, LA County and the poverty rate is higher. Uh, the map shows the household distrib income distribution across the city. The higher incomes are on the west side and the lowest incomes are in the neighborhoods on the east side along Palmdale Boulevard. How long people are expected to live is also lower in the city than in LA County and a quarter of the population report difficulty getting health care. Um, the two major med medical facilities in the city are the Palm, are Palmdale Regional Medical Center and the South Valley Health Center. Um, the area east of uh, State Route 14 is identified as a shortage area for medical health providers and the entire city is uh, designated as a mental health provider shortage area. These are federal designations uh, related to the number of primary care physicians or men mental health care professionals of per uh, thousand population. Uh, this figure shows the existing land use in the city, and as you can tell, uh, almost 30% of the land in the city is vacant, and about 37% is dedicated for parks and open space. Uh, a large portion is um, for industrial or mining extraction type uses, and the next, ma uh, next largest use is residential, primarily single family. Uh, this map generally shows what the arrangement of these land uses are. Uh, in, on the upper middle of the map, you can see the large blue circle, which is where Plant 42 is, and that area has almost 10,000 jobs. Uh, the yellow generally shows the si single-family neighborhoods throughout the, uh, through the city itself, and the areas in red are focused, which are commercial uses are focused at the mall and along uh, Palmdale Boulevard, and then there are some additional uh, a additional uh, shopping areas at uh, on the east side and some smaller areas on the west side. Uh, Palmdale has the benefit of having housing that's affordable compared to the rest of the county. Almost two thirds uh, of residents own their own home. However, 14% fourteen of, homeowner, uh, of homeowners pay more than 50% of their income in housing costs, so they are housing, uh, they're overburdened. And almost 37% of renters pay more than 30% of their household income for, for rent. Uh, and again, they are designated as being cost overburdened. Um, the average home price in the city uh, for sale is $325,000. Uh, uh, some statistics about transportation, about where people work and what their commute is. 86% um, of residents of Palmdale actually work elsewhere, and 76% of these drive alone to work. On the average commute time, one way, is about 42 minutes, and about 74% of workers in Palmdale live outside, commute into Palmdale, so they have long commutes into the city. And uh, about half of these have a commute long, uh, of these folks have a commute longer than 45 minutes. So as you can tell, there's a mismatch. Folks in Palmdale who live here are leaving for work and uh, workers are coming in from elsewhere. So the jobs housing balance um, may, be, uh, may need to be considered as we uh, go through the general plan process. Uh, most of the jobs in the city are tied to manufacturing and aerospace, and this continues to grow, uh, grow the fastest. Um, there's great dependency on the aerospace spec uh, sector, um, with the various uh, aerospace companies located in and around Plant 42. Uh, most of the workers, as I said, live elsewhere, so there's a fair number of hotels and food services that support the workers in these um, in this location and healthcare is the third largest category of employment and there are few professional and technical jobs in Palmdale. Uh, Plant 42 is um, as you all know is a U.S. Air Force facility and uh, it has room for several government-owned contract 
tractor operated facilities as well and ha has room for companies such as Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, and there's also a NASA facility. Uh, the city is working to bring passenger air service by building a terminal and as you can see on the map there's a big white circle, a dot in the upper left corner. Uh, that is the potential location for a air uh, for a t air service terminal which would use the runways in plant 42 to provide provide the service yes um, and then uh, one important aspect to keep in mind is because of plant 42 activities the, um, there are land use re restrictions related to operations not only in on that property but also along the flight path and in the surrounding areas. So we'll need to keep that in mind as we consider um, future land uses. And finally, very briefly, uh, the city has a goal of uh, for park space at five acres per thousand but we are, uh, city currently has less than half of that per population so that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, these, all these data points then form the baseline for the first phase of community engagement, which I'll describe briefly. Um, this engagement effort was uh, one of the most extensive efforts that, are, um, that the city has undertaken since the last general plan. And the first phase of engagement was focused on learning from the community. And what we asked them was, what is important in the city? What makes Palmdale special? What are the issues and challenges facing the city? And what should the future of the city be? And to date, we have met with over 600 residents in person and reached another 800 on, online. So it's been very extensive and there's, in all the future phases of the project, there'll continue to be additional engagement opportunities. Um, Actually, let me back up here. Uh, just to summarize, so we started the process with stakeholder focus groups, which were held back in March. Uh, we had two workshops, one on a weeknight, one on a weekend, to allow uh, all residents opportunities to attend and provide input. We had an online community survey, which was open for almost four months, to, again, which had a very good response rate of almost uh, over 750 responses. And then we had pop-up workshops at uh, five different community events where uh, booths were set up. And as you can see from the images on the right, um, where people could stop by and provide uh, additional input. Um, we've also met with the General Plan Advisory Committee uh, four times, and we have several more meetings uh, with them in, in the upcoming months. Uh, we used a whole uh, range of uh, tools to get the word out and uh, again I won't read through all of these but as you can tell it's an extensive list. Uh, there were bilingual opportunities, meetings, um, the workshops had translators available for those who needed, um, in, needed Spanish language uh, uh, help. Um, the, all the flyers were in were were in both in English and Spanish. Um, the there were items on Spanish radio. Uh, there were digital billboards and uh, other media, online social media opportunities as well. Uh, we have a project website that is uh, periodically updated with the latest information about upcoming events as well as all the events related to the General Plan Advisory Committee and other other meetings. Um, this is a su very summarized list of all the issues that we have heard from the community so far. Um, it includes um, it includes uh, many of the issues that were present during the 1993 general plan but it also includes some additional issues that rose to the top uh, as we talked to these uh, hundreds of uh, residents and uh, in, in the community. So briefly, these included creating a sense of place or downtown in Palmdale, uh, providing pedestrian friendly amenities and place making, offering additional housing diversity um, or 
housing choices for residents, people of all abilities, incomes, and uh, and ages. Um, spaces for public gathering, uh, higher education opportunities. Uh, we heard a lot about the desire to see a four-year university in um, in Palmdale. More amenities for the youth and uh, young adults. That ties into what we saw with the demographic split in the city that there are a lot of young folks, um, young kids in the city and their desire is to continue to live in Palmdale but they uh, have limited opportunities for both education, higher education and then jobs that um, means that they end up leaving, uh, leaving the city they grew up in. So based on all these issues that we, uh, were identified and working with the General Plan Advisory Committee, our team has prepared and refined uh, vision themes and guiding principles. Um, these are meant to provide a framework that will guide future decision making and the writing of the plan. And these flow out from the, the community uh, ideas that we heard from the community. And they form a reference point or anchor when policy trade-offs are being considered. So how, how, how do these vision themes and, um, and guiding principles actually play a role in the development of the general plan? So for example, one of the vision themes is tied to preserving open space in nature. And the guiding pr principle associated with it is um, could be a city with access to abundant open spaces, trails, and community parks. The strategies or policies that come out of th that guiding principle could be related to expanding and improving access to parks and open space, and also to secure fundings for ongoing acquisition and maintenance of those um, open space areas. So. Um, as I said, the, open, the vision themes and the guiding principles begin to set up the framework for uh, establishing the goals and policies when we get into the detailed work of developing policies for each of the, uh, the elements in the general plan. Um, there are five, nine major um, vision themes that uh, were established, and these are broad and address all aspects of life in Palmdale. They include creating a downtown, uh, diversifying the local economy with more job options, providing more housing option, uh, housing choices for residents, uh, preserving Palmdale's natural setting, and creating a safe and healthy city. Uh, for each of these vision themes, there are several um, guiding principles, and uh, there's a lot of these, so I won't read through all of all of them, but they tie in and further expand on how the vision that's established in the theme can be, uh, can be implemented. So just briefly, uh, creating an active and uh, vibrant downtown environment and improving the appearance of Palmdale Boulevard are tied with the um, overall vision of creating an active and vibrant downtown. Um, addressing crime and safety and improving access to parks uh, and open space as well as quality healthcare services are tied in uh, with the theme of creating a safe and healthy place to live and work. Um, we heard a lot about creating a diverse and resilient economy. Uh, there, was, there have been uh, there are a lot of aerospace jobs and the economy of the city is tied to the ups and downs in the in, in with the fortunes of the aerospace uh, industry and so one of the themes is to create diversity in the job options available in the city to create a more uh, sustainable and uh, resilient economy that doesn't fluctuate as as much as um, as uh, the aerospace industry might uh, and, Again, options for housing um, and different types of housing. Most of the housing in the city is single family to create more affordable housing options uh, like the project you approved earlier today uh, are what uh, residents would like to see. And I mentioned the desire to see more educational opportunities as well. 
Uh, and then there were additional uh, principles related to preserving the natural setting and uh, building on the transportation options that are uh, coming to Palmdale in the future. And with that, um, I'd like to open it up for any questions that you might have on this long presentation and, uh, and then uh, get your feedback on, on the guiding principles as well. Okay, any questions or comments? So it, it appears this is not a general plan update. This is a whole brand new general plan. <coughs> so, um, yes and no. <laughs> uh, because we did so, general plan updates right. over the years. Yeah, so there's been some minor updates that have happened since 1993. Um, like Simran stated, a lot has happened since then. That's quite a long time ago. However, there are some really good things in that 1993 plan that we're not going to leave behind. So we're going to take what was good and incorporate it into this plan. It's going to look a lot different. It's going to feel a lot different. Um, but all that work that was done previously is going to be wrapped, wrapped into this. So the good work continues. But yes, a very different looking plan. So... On the presentation that you said they, that nothing had been done since 1993, 1994, I remember doing some pretty major uh, general plan updates in the 2000s. So, um, no comprehensive so. Uh, to the element, specifically. So, on the slide it mentioned all the elements within our existing general plan. So, none of those elements have been updated as a whole except for the housing element, which is mandated by the state um, to be updated every seven years. I remember years. we did the community design. I remember that one very specifically. We did the community design. We did a lot of changes in the community design element. And that was in the 2000s. Right. Yeah, and all those changes are listed throughout the general plan as well. Um, we have, but comprehensively, no element has been completely updated. Right. 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 And there are additional uh, stage requirements relating to complete streets and uh, safety as well as healthy, healthy communities that need to be addressed. I do know um, in regards to some of the community engagement, I see that Nardi is here and I've seen her out in the community um, trying to get people, you know, 2045, Palmdale 2045. And one of the things that was very encouraging that is so important for us to realize is it is the youth that this that need to be aware of this because, you know, uh, we're aging here and they're the ones that are going to have to live with this. You know, say we do get it done and it lasts as long as our last one did, you know, it's going to really matter to them. So I appreciate the fact that you've been targeting the youth and really trying to get out there and get them engaged because this is going to have a huge impact on their future. And... Um, and I do know that all of the transportation, there's so much going on in transportation right now that that's going to be an interesting incorporation, I think, to make sure that it's fluid and flowing and ready for all the cool things that are coming. But I want to thank the GPAC committee. How many members of the GPAC are here this evening? Well, thank you. One more meeting. Yay, team. Um, <laughs> and this is about the latest my meetings ever go, so. Um, but... I thank you for taking the time to serve on that because it is critical for our community that you be involved and that you listen to all of our citizens, our constituents, everybody out there to make sure that we're trying to, to not necessarily do what they want, but listen to that and do what's best for our community because oftentimes what we want is not necessarily the best thing. But um, So I appreciate your time not only being here but serving on, on all of those meetings as well and getting people to comment. So, and I do, I know, I saw a lot of activity on Facebook, and um, I know that it's been reached out through all the various um, Facebooks and Instagrams the city has, and that's what we need to be doing, to, to reach those younger folk that know how to utilize those things. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see the statistics reflect the younger generation that we have here. Um, I have a lot of teenagers that have just graduated, 20-somethings, um, and they're having a hard time finding jobs, finding places to live, and they are looking to leave because there's nowhere for them to live, there's nowhere for them to work, um, and it's difficult for them to stay here. So I was glad to see those, the statistics reflecting that as well. At one of our community workshops, 
uh, which was held at a, a high school, um, one of the teachers uh, offered extra credit to his students. So there was a whole contingent of high school students who were who shared some of the same same thoughts. They were, you know, juniors and seniors looking, thinking about their future in college and saying, much as they would like to stay here, they they may have to leave. Mm -hmm. um, in the in the future phases, we also have focus groups which will target uh, hard to reach audiences and one of those will be um, focused on uh, school age or young adults mm -hmm. to get additional information and uh, additional feedback from them because as you said we are planning for for the, them I think that'll be important because that as they increase in their schooling now we've got educated folks here but not if they all leave so uh, having ABC here is great. Northridge isn't that far, um, but if they don't live at home, there's nowhere for them to stay. So I think that's a, that'll be an important element. The uh, six stage uh, phrase that you laid out. Yes. Wh where are we at this point? I, I, I wanted to see I, if we can, can just go, go back, back to that real quick. Of course. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry. Stage two. We are at the <laughs> we're, we're near the end of stage <laughs> two. There we go. Oh, we oh, are stage three. <laughs> okay. So where are we? We're at stage three. We are coming into stage three. We are transitioning to stage three, uh, which is the alternatives phase um, that will kick off n next year um, in January. We have a meeting with the GPAC to begin to develop plan use alternatives in the middle of January, and then uh, we'll have additional meetings. The first set of workshops. The next set of workshops where we'll uh, work with the, bring those to the community will happen in April and May. Uh, and there'll be, a, again, another online survey which uh, will allow um, residents to give input um, if they can't make it to actual meetings. We'll have additional pop-up meetings. We'll, have, um, uh, we'll also have the focus groups that I mentioned during that phase to get and is there an effort, and maybe the uh, general prom, prom advisor can, can answer this, with respect to reaching out to the community folks, um, is there an effort to reach out to the churches as well as to the chambers um, yes. to present this plan? Um, at the start of the process, in the discovery phase, um, we interviewed, we met with the local r religious institutions as well as the chambers, uh, Air, folks from the aerospace groups, um, schools, uh, and uh, representat uh, representatives from the uh, from the college, economic development, economic sector. development sector, and we'll be going back to some of them uh, later in the phase to get their feedback again on, awesome. on the plan. Awesome. Last question: Can we get a copy of this presentation, or is that not ready for? Um, for this is available. Uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. It will be up on our the project website uh, as early as tomorrow, but um, Carleen has, has it and we can <laughs> send it over as well. Great job, thank you. Great. Any other questions, comments? Just one last thing. Um, so you do have the memo of the vision guiding uh, principles. If um, you have any feedback that uh, you don't want to bring up this evening, um, if you can send Rob an email, um, that would be very helpful. Yeah, that was in your and don't packet see of see stuff on the dais. Yes. You do have that. Yeah. Yes. And it was um, up on the screen stuff, when yeah. Simran yeah. was presenting. It was, um, yeah, so she went over most of yes. it. Thank Just you. if you do have any comments, we're, they're not final quite yet. We are going to be presenting um, a little bit more of a detailed presentation, believe it or not, uh, <laughs> next week to our city council and soliciting some feedback on those as well. All right. Well, thank you very much. I know this is a huge undertaking, so thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right. Then that will bring us to item 10, staff communications. Um, another piece of paper that you walked in tonight um, is the preliminary agenda for the next meeting. Uh, we did have one more item that was another hotel and a parcel map, but we received comments from Fish and Wildlife that are going to trigger uh, amending that document and recirculating it. So that's 
being pushed off into the future. But we do have one cell provider that the agent asked us to group all of her applications on one meeting to save her travel time. So we've done that. So it's going to be nothing but time extensions for cell towers in July, in January. I keep doing that. <laughs> January. And that's it for staff communications on my side. All right. Mr. Doran. Well, I'm hopeful to add to that agenda uh, something about <gasps> accessory <laughs> dwelling units. Uh, Your time is up, sir. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the, the state is at it again, and uh, we're required to amend our, our regulations of accessory dwelling units. Um, so we'll be uh, hopefully bringing that in, in January or definitely in February if we can't make the January meeting. Uh, but aside from that, I just want to wish everyone a happy holidays. Um, I think it's been a great year, and I look forward to next year. Thank you very much. All right, item 11, Planning Commission Communications. I had the pleasure of attending training this evening and I learned about wireless communications and all the legalities involved therein. So thank you very much Drew for that training and who else got to go do that? I know. All right. Very nice so, do we not look smarter? I think we look smarter. <laughs> not than you, just smarter than we did before. Is not. I so. like how she looked at you. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right, and I would like to say <coughs> Merry Christmas to everyone. Enjoy your holidays. And Merry Christmas and Merry Christmas. Hmm? Mm -hmm. You fell asleep for that. Thank you for listening. All right, so with that, I shall adjourn this meeting to our regular planning commission meeting of Thursday, January 9th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Thank you all very much. Oh my goodness. <laughs>